Hey friends, Jabin here. We're about to jump into God's word and I am believing and praying that it's going to be a blessing to your life. And I just wanted to ask you a question really quick. Has City Light Church, has this ministry been a blessing to you? And if it has, I wanted to ask you to prayerfully consider partnering with us in our miracle offering. Our miracle offering is a special one time over and above normal giving that we are giving specifically towards our new building here in Las Vegas. You know, Las Vegas is one of the most unchurched, unreached cities in America. Uh, one organization has recently come out and said, we are actually pre-Christian, not post-Christian, but pre-Christian. There has never been a significant uh, culture shaping move of God in this city. Well, we're believing, we're praying to change that. And if you would like to be a part of this brand new endeavor as we build this new building for the glory of God, I want to encourage you to join your faith with ours. No gift is too small. No gift is too big. Uh, we are believing to serve more people, love more people, reach more people with the message of Jesus. And if you uh, feel a connection to this ministry, if you want to be a part of it, you can go to citylightvegas.com forward slash give and be a part of what God is doing here and around the world. I love you so much. Let's get into the word. Matthew 11, verse 28. We read this last week. We're here again. We're in a series called The Requirements for Rest and um, heard just so much great feedback from last week and uh, and believing believing for the same today. We were in Matthew 11 last week. We're, we're coming back to Matthew 11 now, verse 28. Uh, very famous passage of scripture um, from the more traditional uh, translations. Uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to me all who are weary. But I love this from the message translation. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you will recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you will learn to live freely and lightly. And I want to talk this morning about real rest. Real rest, real rest. Father, I pray you speak now in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 So it's pretty amazing in America because we have so much, so much opportunity, so much technology, so much money, so much resource, and yet we find ourselves as one of the most stressed out, addicted, and medicated cultures in the world. And I read this stat last week, but I wanted to share it again. 76% of adult Americans say that they are experiencing stress that is impacting their physical health and have done so in the last month. 38% connected to headaches, 35% connected to feeling nervous or anxious, 34% fatigue, 33% feeling depressed. And so what is stress? Again, we're, we're talking about rest for your stress. Stress is the condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that the demands exceed the personal and social resource that the individual is able to mobilize. So what is stress? Stress is when I have more demand than I have resource. When there's more going on on the outside than there is peace on the inside, that's where I get stressed. And I just want to say this again. I cannot guarantee less demand. <laughs> Just have more faith and you'll be less stressed. Just have more faith and things won't ever go wrong. Just have more faith and you'll never have issues. Just have more faith and God will put you in a faith bubble and nothing bad will ever happen or nothing stressful will ever happen. I can't, I can't guarantee any of that. So I cannot guarantee less demand, but I know we can be better resourced. Say amen, everybody. Amen. I know we can be better resourced for the demand. So again, I just remind you right now, Lake Mead, there's more demand than resource. And we keep finding dead bodies, amen, because, 
because we're, we're pulling on that so hard. There's so much demand on the lake, but there's so little resource coming in. And that's what a lot of our lives look like. Our lives look like Lake Mead, and it just gets lower and lower. My, my sister went to UNLV, so I remember 20 years ago coming here, and you would go to Hoover Dam, and you would look over, and the water was right there, and you would see those giant carp. Does anybody, was anybody around? Anybody that old? Y'all remember that? I see some locals here. Y'all remember that? You would look right over, and there was just giant fish right there. Now they're like 700 feet away saying, send water. Because there's more demand than there is supply. So listen, we, we've got to work on this supply. So, so most of our life is lived praying away problems instead of building the supply. Listen to me, there is a rest for your stress. And here's the first thing that I have learned that has helped me to walk in the rest of God and it's acceptance. Jesus said, come to me, come to me. This is the first invitation, Matthew 11, very interesting. Matthew 11 is the first public invitation of Jesus to the masses. Come to me. And you know what I love about it? He is inviting religious people, the Jews who hated him, to come to him. He just walked them through, read Matthew 11, that is a very intense chapter. He just walked them through that if anybody else would have seen these miracles, signs, wonders, and teaching, they would have followed me. They would have obeyed me. They would have repented of their sin. And he goes, but you just refused to. And they hated him. And to a group that hates him and wants him dead, he says, come to me. <laughs> My arms are still open wide. I know you want to kill me, but come to me. I know, I know you hate me, but come to me. I know you want me dead, but come to me. Not get away from me, not you foul sinner, come to me. Very good. This is his first public invitation, and he does it to the Jewish community that at the time hated him. Here's what you're going to find, that that is going to be the words of the Lord to you over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Come to me. Yes. Feeling a little cold spiritually? Come to me. Feeling tired and worn out? Come to me. Feeling defeated? Come. There is always an invitation from heaven. Come on. Come back, come back, come back, come back, come back. Here's what you're going to read 14 times in the epistles. Here's the greeting that Paul would use, John would use, Peter would use, Jude would use. Here it is. Grace and peace be unto you. Grace and peace, grace and peace. I cannot have rest without grace and peace. Grace is supernatural, peace is supernatural, listen to me, and rest is supernatural. Because good, good. I'm not talking about a rest that comes from a two-week Hawaii vacation. I'm not talking about a rest that comes from, from, from a couple of days off around the holidays. I'm talking about a supernatural rest for your soul. Yes. Yes. Amen, everybody. Amen. And it comes by grace and peace. When I, say, when I say acceptance, I'm talking about God accepts you. I'm talking about there is a grace I'm talking about, I, I've said this for years and I, 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 I didn't quite get it, but grace gives me the ability to exhale, just to yes. Yes. Ah, breathe. Yes. Yes. I'm accepted. Yes. Very good. Jesus is inviting me to come closer. There will never be rest without grace and peace, but because of the grace and peace of God, I can now live at rest. Now, now, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about the Old Testament Sabbath that happened on a Saturday. It was the seventh day. So you labored for six, and then you rested. You worked really hard, and then you rested. That's the Old Testament idea of the Sabbath. But something very unique happens in the New Testament. You know what happens in the New Testament? Jesus rises from the dead on the first day, Sunday. Sunday. And when that happened, the New Testament church changed worship from Saturday to Sunday. And they now call Sunday, here's what you read in the New Testament, the Lord's Day. Wow. Remember when John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Remember when, when the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, I want you to gather on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. And on that day, I want you to give your offering. 
They, they change the day from Saturday to Sunday to celebrate the resurrection. Watch this. In the Old Testament, you worked really hard, and after working really hard, you got to say, okay, I'm done. In the New Covenant, you start with, it is done. Wow, wow. <laughs> you don't work really hard and then prove that you get to have a rest. You start the week. You know tomorrow's not the first day of the week, right? You know that, right? It's Monday. Here we go again. Uh uh Sunday's the first day of the week. I don't start my week with work. I start my week with rest. In the world, they start the week on Monday, but in the kingdom, we start the week on Sunday. I start the week saying, I've got nothing to prove. I've got nothing to show, but my father's going to take care of me this week coming up. And I'm starting my week not with hustle and grind, but with worship and family and food and rest. Because God, the, the, the scripture said in Genesis that he, he Sabbathed on the seventh day because he had completed his work. God didn't Sabbath because he was tired. He Sabbathed because it was finished. Ah, man, I feel, I'm sorry. I just felt the Holy Ghost. I don't know what, ah, I don't know what that was. Forgive me. And now we don't Sabbath because we're exhausted. Because if you're exhausted, you've, you've already gone too far. We Sabbath because it's finished. And then, we, so what we're doing is a preemptive rest because yes. there will be stress and there will be demands and there will be things and there will be needs and life will be life. But because I've Sabbathed yes. first, I now have a resource because it's finished. Yes. So my first day of the week is not Monday. The first day of the week is Sunday. It's the Lord's day and I'm resting before I've proved anything to anybody. It's accepted. I'm accepted. I'm loved. Amen. Remember when the father looked at Jesus in Matthew 3 and he said, that's my beloved son, whom I love, whom I'm well pleased. You know, Jesus had no one miracle, hadn't taught one yeah. message, hadn't healed one person, hadn't multiplied yeah. one piece of it. He hadn't done nothing. And God said, I love you so much. Yes. Yes. I'm so pleased with you. Yes. Yes. And now what the father says about, about his first son, he says about all of his sons and daughters. And he looks at us and he goes, I'm so pleased with you on the first day of the week. You haven't done, but God, I haven't done anything yet. I haven't made any money yet. I haven't worked hard yet. I haven't proven anything yet. And he goes, I know you know. It. I'm accepted. Huh. That, that's where rest starts. Rest starts with acceptance, but now it moves into alignment. Look what he says next. So first he says, come to me. Here's what he says next. I'll show you. Let me teach you. I'm going to say a phrase that I hope means something to you. Jesus wants to be your teacher. Huh. I've, I have more and more friends now in, in leadership spaces and places. And I was talking with a friend of mine who, um, and, and I have a lot of friends who, We'll meet with big, big leadership gurus. Hey, you can go to this, sp spend a day with so-and-so for $50,000. Hey, you can spend $150,000 a year to be in this guy's mentoring program. And hey, you can, I, I get invited all the time. Hey, you can go to this round table with this pastor and it's X amount of dollars. Or, cool, cool, cool. All those are good. All those are good. Man, if you got the resource to do it, do it. But there is a teacher Who will talk to you? Yes. Yes. <sighs> He's free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Jesus wants to be your teacher. He wants to be your mentor. He wants to be. So let me go back to Hebrews 4.11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter into the rest. 
of God to know and experience it for ourselves so that no one will fall by following the same example of disobedience as those who died in the wilderness. So the apostle Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews says, hey, don't be like the guys in the Old Testament who complained and disobeyed their way out of rest. So, So now hear me. There is a rest that only obedience can bring. I'm going to say that one more time. There is a rest that only obedience can bring. Like, there's a confidence I have and a rest I have in my integrity, in my alignment. No one's ever going to call Shannon, hey, I've been... I've been sleeping with your husband. (laughs) No one's ever going to say I did something weird with the money at the church. I have a rest. I can just, I can sleep well at night because I just know how I live. I get the occasional traffic ticket. Amen. (laughs) I'm not proud of that. I was speeding the other day, got pulled over. I was so embarrassed. And the, Police officer walked up to me. I looked at him and went, I'm an idiot. (laughs) He started laughing. That's a good way to start a convo with him. I'm an idiot. Now, what do you want? I'm an idiot. And I go, I I drive this road every day. I work on this road. I didn't say I'm a pastor. I didn't say, I said, I I work, I I know better. And he looks at me and goes, pastor? And then I went, oh, I'm so embarrassed. That's like, I said, I'm so embarrassed. I said, please give me a ticket. Because now I just, he goes, no, no, get out of here. Get out of here. He goes, I'm not giving you a ticket. I said, please give me a ticket. I said, I'm so embarrassed. He said, I work at your church sometimes. I said, I'm so sorry. Okay, so where does, where does obedience begin? Okay, I just said that rest begins with grace and peace, right? Here's where obedience begins, with eyes and ears. Everyone say, I gate. Say, ear gate. Ear gate. Poke someone in the eye. No, no, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> you, you have an eye gate and you have an ear gate. And obedience begins and or disobedience begins with your eyes and ears. Yeah. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 6, the lamp of the body is in the eye. Yeah. If therefore your eye is good, in other words, if you're looking at good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, if you're looking at bad or looking for bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So maybe you've heard this little phrase, eyes are the window to your soul. It's true. That's not in the Bible, but it's true. Because if I look at good... There's going to be light on the inside of me. If I look at bad, there's going to be darkness on the inside of me. You determine what you allow your eyes to look at. And your eyes, hear this, your eyes feed your soul. What you look at feeds your soul. What you listen to influences your soul. Let me say this, I cannot choose everything I see, but I can choose everything I look at. Can I be just super real? Can we just be, let me talk to the men real quick. March is going to roll around, fellas, and it's going to get warm outside. And you're going to walk into Target, and every woman's going to forget to wear clothes. Have you ever noticed that around springtime, you walk into Target, you go, we're wearing underwear today, we're... And I don't judge them, beautiful women. This last spring, when, it, when, it, when that season changes, I was walking with Goldie in Target. She goes, Dad, why is that woman wearing a bathing suit? I said, I don't know, honey. I don't, I'm just looking ahead, running into things. I don't know, babe, but I just can't right now. Literally, she goes, Dad, why is she wearing a bathing suit? I don't know, babe, but it's, but it's real. <laughs> Watch. I can't help what I see. Beautiful woman, praise the Lord. That's totally different then. (laughs) 
These women really got to wear more clothes. <laughs> no, they don't. I'm not responsible for them, and they're not responsible for me. I'm responsible for me. I've never judged a woman for how she dresses in this city. I could care less. It's on me because I can't help what I see. But I can help what I look at. And my eyes are feeding my soul. So, so you, we should probably be asking the question, what the, what the heck is my soul? Good, I'm glad you asked. It's your mind, will, and emotions. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Let me say it like this, and it's redundant on purpose. Your soul decides your decisions. Every decision you make comes from your soul, mind, will, and emotions. So your mind needs the mind of Christ. Because some of you are going, no, my spirit doesn't. Nope. My flesh doesn't. Nope. Your soul does. So my mind needs the mind of Christ. My will needs the power of the Holy Ghost. My emotions need the healing power of Jesus. So my mind, will, and emotions all need the touch of God because from my soul, I'm going to make decisions. From my soul, I'm either going to let my spirit lead or my body lead. Yeah? So either I'm just going, I'm just going to live in the animal kingdom and I'm just going to go on every desire I have, right? Or I'm going to live by my spirit and I'm going to live by my new nature, but my soul is the umpire. So what I look at is deciding. Let me give you one more scripture that I've read a lot in this church and we'll read a lot more. A good man. Man, I'd like to be a good man. Anybody, I'd like to be a good, good. I'd like to just be a good person. I'd like to, a good man. How do I become a good man? Out of the good treasure of his heart, we could say soul, the core of who you are, brings forth good things. An evil man. How could someone do that? How could someone say that? How could someone lie like that? How could someone kill like that? How could someone be so violent? How could someone be so prideful? How could someone leave their family? How could an evil man? Let me tell you how to have the evil treasure. You don't wake up one day and become an evil person. You feed it. Yeah? Brings forth evil things. That means that before it's brought forth, it's been growing on the inside. Before good is brought forth, it's been growing on the inside. So what I'm allowing in to my eyes and into my ears is influencing my soul. Remember Psalm 23 says this, he restores my soul. Okay, only God can restore my soul, but only I can look. <laughs> Am I preaching all quiet this morning? Is that okay? So, so here's the problem with a lot of people in, in the church. We do whatever we want for six days, and then we walk in on Sunday morning and go, Lord, restore my soul. Wow. And God goes, yeah, but my restoring of your soul is directly connected to what you're looking at. So, so God says, only I can restore your soul, but I can only do that in agreement with what your eyes are looking at. And what your wow. ears are listening to. Wow, man. So if all I do is look at wrong, bad stuff, listen to bad stuff. And I mean, it could be anything. I'm not just talking about sexual things. It could just be fear. It could be yeah, it, yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah. We're just feeding, feeding, feeding. Negative, 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 negative. And then we walk in on Sunday and go, Lord, I need a miracle. Restore my soul. And God goes, okay, we, let's start. First day of the week, let's start. <laughs> but we're going to have to come into partnership here. 
And the opposite is true. You'll, you'll start feeding on good, listening to good, feeding on good, feeding on good, feeding on good, feeding on good. And your soul gets restored. You never even asked for it. Because David never said, Lord, please restore my soul. He said, he does restore my soul. He will do that. If I'll do that. I'm talking about alignment. Lastly, this leads then to assignment. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live. That's what Jesus said. So people are always asking this question, what's my purpose? What's God's will for my life? How do I know what God has for me? How do I know where I'm supposed to go? How do I know where I'm supposed to move? How do I know what job to take? How do I know what I'm supposed to do with my career? How do I know who to date? How do I know who to marry? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? What's God's will for my life? What's God's will for my life? I'm going to be honest with you. I think you're asking the wrong question. If you'll get close to Jesus, he'll show you. You'll just, thank you, Frank Scandura. You'll just know. Yes, yes. Can I say it how I say it? You'll know it in your knower. Yeah. I just know. And you couldn't talk me out of it, and I don't know how I know. I know it by the Spirit. Yeah. So good. <laughs> you just. You keep company. That's what Jesus, just keep coming. You'll just learn. You'll just learn. He'll just talk to you and you don't even know. He's just, you're just growing. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. And here's the problem with most of us. We like the second part of that sentence. But we don't like to light yourself in the Lord, which, by the way, you're missing out on because that's the best part of the, you're you're missing out. That's actually the best part. Better than the job, better than the money, better than the the friend, better than the whatever is the, you learn intimacy with Almighty God, you hear his voice. Oh, and by the way, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Assignment. How do I know? Know God. <laughs> if, if you'll do that, you'll learn. I don't, I don't pray a lot about direction. I don't. But I work really hard on my walk with, with connecting with God and feeling an intimate connection with God. And then when decisions need to be made, it's amazing how they're just, there's a wisdom there to do it. Uh, Jesus said it like this. Uh, he told his disciples, don't worry about what you're going to say. When it's time to talk, the Holy Spirit will give you the words. If you'll just walk with the Holy Spirit, you'll get put in situations and wisdom will start flowing. And you'll know your assignment. You'll know what to do. And you'll know what job to take. And you'll know. And you'll know it by the Spirit. Not because you've been seeking. It's not wrong to seek answers. Please hear what I'm saying. But I am saying a lot of us just live our whole life doing that and not digging that well of intimacy. Yes. Think, think about this. Man, the keys come up. I got to land this plane in two minutes. We're coming in for final approach. <laughs> You won't be able to write these down, but maybe we'll put them somewhere on. Adam, uh, God told Adam what to do, tend the garden. God told Noah what to do, build a boat. God told Abraham what to do, go to the land. God told Jacob what to do, serve Laban. God told Joseph what to do, interpret the dream. God told Moses what to do, deliver Israel. God told Joshua what to do, march around Jericho. God told David what to do, fund the building of the temple. God told Isaiah what to do, speak my word. God told the disciples what to do, the Great Commission. God told Paul what to do, go to the Gentiles. God was never like, man, I don't know. 
I don't know, Moses, Pharaoh's pretty powerful. Or, no, God always had a plan. It was just that those, those men, those women, those, they had to get quiet enough and at rest enough and in alignment enough to hear their assignment. God will talk to you. God will talk to you about your kids. God will talk to you about your future. God will talk to you about your business. God will talk. God will. God has, I promise you, let me say it like this in the most respectful, God-fearing way I can say it. God is, has a very clear opinion <laughs> about your life. And if you'll just get under that alignment, you'll hear his assignment. And when you have received acceptance, alignment, and assignment, rest becomes the fruit of that relationship with God. Come to me. Come to me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word today. We, we receive it. We believe it. We ask for the faith to walk it out. Just with your head bowed and eyes closed, if you're in this room, you say, Jabin, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to receive that. He's, he's calling me to come to him, and I need to receive that today. Pray with me now. I'm going to ask everyone in the room, pray this out loud. Everyone online, pray this out loud. Everyone in every correctional facility, pray this out loud. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again, and I come to you now, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord.